to do for you guys today is talk a little bit about invasive blood pressure monitoring and arterial catheters because I think it's something that if we're doing it regularly, um, it's, it's not a big deal and it really can save patients that otherwise might not be saved. So patients like um, septic abdomens uh, and that sort of thing where obviously maintaining their weight so I've done a few little training videos for you uh, and we're going to go through that today. The hardest part about invasive pressures is obviously placing the art line. So this is something that does take practice. So the best way to achieve that is actually make friends with your surgery department and find a nice healthy TPLO or um, TTA and, and practice all the way. The great thing about invasive pressures is it gives us a beat-to-beat uh, measurement of blood pressure and that's provided by a direct connection from the art line um, to a pressure transducer to a monitor. Transducer converts uh, the pressure, pulsatile blood flow. It um, transduces that into a waveform on the screen and uh, obviously it's a much more accurate modality than non-invasive um, pressures, whether it be oscillometric or um, Doppler, particularly in our critical patients. It is important when you're talking to clients about this to be aware of the risks and contraindications. So this is just a little diagram of the setup. Um, basically, you've got your outline connected to your patient, um, some semi-rigid tubing. This is the pressure transducer, which has a connection to either a fluid bag or a syringe with saline in it um, and also a graphical display of the pulse waveform, whether it be a surgery bed or a cardel or something like that. So the type of cases that we use invasive pressure monitoring for in Melbourne include basically any patient with sepsis or septic shock, uh, so long as they don't have a raging coagulopathy. I think a GDV is a great case. Of course, we never have 10 nurses standing around helping us with these cases in the middle of the night, uh, and it is a little bit laborious or labour-intensive to start with. Hemabdomens, um, perforated foreign bodies. We had a craniotomy case here in Melbourne that we put um, an outline in last week. Any polytrauma patient undergoing surgery and um, really any ventilator patient. I think part of the reason why we don't do a lot of outlines in Melbourne with our ventilator patients is that a fair percentage of them are snake bites, whether it be tiger snake or brown snake, and they often have a um, coagulopathy when we first meet them. Some risks of arterial catheters. Uh, obviously, we can get thrombosis like we can with any catheters. We can get catheter dislodgement, um, which can lead to massive hemorrhage. We can get blocked catheters, and there is a small chance of infection. So what do we need when we're setting up for invasive pressure monitoring? Um, diagrams here just show a couple of the basic components. Obviously, you need a catheter, and I just use a uh, standard IV catheter, probably not the cheapest one at ZebraVet, but a decent quality IV catheter, a three-way tap and a bung, all the standard preparation gear that you need to put an, uh, any IV or arterial catheter in, some tapes, I like to put an off-site and, uh, as our nurses here call it, a little comfort spot. And this is then going to be connected to the pressure transducer. So, for example, the SurgiVet uses a Becton dixon um, DTX Plus transducer. The Cardell that they have in Adelaide uses a slightly different um, transducer, which uh, Sophie over there has product details for. And uh, essentially, as I mentioned before, you can either prime the system with a 50ml syringe or 
a bag of saline um, in a pressure bag as long as it's got about 300 millimetres of mercury of, of pressure. I usually like to prime the teapot first and I also set aside a 20-gauge needle, which I'll show you in a minute why we need the 20-gauge needle. So the basic sequence of what connects to what is uh, you've got your art line down here and you've got your semi-rigid tubing here with a little white three-way tap, which becomes important later when we're looking at zeroing the system. You've got the pressure transducer, fluid bag or 60 mil syringe, and then that all connects up to the surgery vet and there's a little connection labelled IBP on the side of the fully featured surgery vets. So not all surgery vets have invasive pressures capabilities. Um, the basic model does not. So the basic steps in putting in an art line, and again, I think this is something that you do need to be doing um, fairly regularly. And the artery that we use is the dorsal pedal artery. So you can see in this picture that the patient's actually in lateral recumbency uh, with the left leg down, and that's that's the leg that we're going to place the line in. Palpate the artery, so between the second and third metatarsal, you can often feel a nice strong pulse. We clip and prep the skin like we would for any catheter, and the reason why... I set aside a 20 gauge needle is I like to make a little nick in the skin so that you're not actually pushing the outline through thick skin and um, advance the catheter in at a 15 degree angle. Here's a little video that I prepared earlier. So placement of the arterial catheter is probably the most technically challenging part of instigating or establishing invasive blood pressure monitoring and this is a technique that needs to be practiced over and over again by the surgery nurses, the ICU nurses, the criticalists, the anaesthetists, whoever's going to be doing these catheters on a regular basis. Best place to, to uh, practice is to make friends with your surgery department, get a big healthy TPLO, TTA type situation uh, and you can go ahead and practice your arterial catheter placement. So the catheter that I'm placing now can be left in for sampling for arterial blood gases. It can be attached to an invasive pressure line, which Rachel's just talked about, uh, which we'll go ahead and show in action after we've placed the arterial line. So patient positioning, lateral recumbency with the limb that you're gonna place the line down on the table as shown. We are palpating the dorsal pedal artery, which runs between the second and third metatarsal. Once you've palpated the artery, we want to prepare the site. We don't want to use an excessive passage of the clipper blades because that will only create irritation. We don't have to be absolutely meticulous or any more than we would be with an intravenous catheter, but we do need to prepare the limb as cleanly and effectively as we can. So this is Corhex scrub. So once we've prepared the limb, it's important just to recap on everything that you have set up. So sterile gloves are the gold standard. You just need tapes and a standard IV catheter with either a bung or if you're going to go ahead and attach to your invasive pressures, I'd suggest maybe having your invasive pressures, your transducer primed and ready to go or just a teapot that's already primed. And I also like to just have, for the bigger dogs with thicker skin, just have an 18 gauge needle or a scalpel handy so that you can actually make a tiny little nick in the skin so you're not pushing your art line too forcefully. And it can be difficult for some people to palpate once you've got the gloves on. Wearing gloves is certainly considered gold standard. And once you get a flashback of blood, you insert the catheter 
and you're ready to go ahead with invasive pressure monitoring. So basically what you can do from there is you, you just want to use the outline for sampling. You can just tape it in um, as per the to here, just with a three-way tap and a pump it swap. So that's half to the outside while it's working. You'll see oh, down here, you'll see the big rush of blood. And yeah, you can obviously hook your um, transducer into that in there, which Rachel's just going to demonstrate now. So that's placement of an arterial catheter. Um, and as I mentioned before, if you don't actually want to do invasive pressures, if you just want to use it for sampling, for example, in a ventilator patient, obviously having frequent arterial blood gases is extremely useful. And, uh, you know, any hypoxemic patient in a phage recumbent patient, intubated patient. So there's sort of two aspects to the way you can utilise the skill of, of actually placing the arterial line. So the next thing that people can find a little bit stressful, particularly if you haven't done it for a while, is actually zeroing the system. So basically what zeroing does is it's a bit like zeroing a set of scales and it basically calibrates the system so the effects of atmospheric pressure and hydrostatic pressure are removed. If you're using it continuously in the ICU, we should really be zeroing the system at the start of every shift or let's say we disconnect it to move the patient out of the theatre or whatever the case might be. Um, after you've redressed the site or once you've taken a blood sample, troubleshooting, that sort of thing, getting rid of ear bubbles. So step one is to flush the system. So what you'll actually see on the pressure transducer is there's a little squeezy bulb, like two little blue tabs that you squeeze together to flush the system. So step two is to level the transducer at what is called the phlebostatic axis. So if you would like to impress anyone, friends, Tinder dates, then you can talk about the phlebostatic axis, which actually just means to have it at the level of the heart. Step three, there's a white stopcock on the semi-rigid tubing between the art line and the pressure transducer. So what you actually do is you turn that stopcock off to the patient and you remove the white cap. So it's a bit of a counterintuitive thing to do, but you're actually opening the system to the outside world and off to the patient. Step five is you then press the zero IBP button on your patient monitor, whether it be your surgery bed or Cardell. And, yeah, you wait a few moments while the system goes through. It's zeroing kind of like exactly like I said before, like a set of scales until zero comes up. And then, yeah, you wait a couple of minutes or probably about 30 seconds and you'll see three zeros appear on your screen and that means that the system has been zeroed. You replace the cap on the little white stopcock and turn it off to the outside world so your system's actually continuous with your patient. And I will show you a little video. You'll have my commentary, I'm sorry, and Rachel and Kate are the stars of the show. So you can see they've sat the um, 60 mil syringe at the level of the heart. We've taped the catheter in. Made a mess in Kate's lovely surgical prep area. Got blood all over the floor. Lost a litre of blood while we're putting in the art line. So this is the little white tap. Uh, three-way tap that I was talking about. So Rachel has just turned that off to the patient, not that three-way tap, the little white one in between her hands. She's palpating the semi-rigid tubing, making sure there's no kinks, giving a little flush and uh, has pressed the zero IBP button. You can see it loosely down the bottom there of the surgery vet screen. And, yeah, we're just third parameter down in pink. It says IBP zeroing needed. So we're just going to zoom in on that button, second from the right on the surgery vet. We press zero IBP and we just count to five or ten and zero, zero, minus one, minus one. Just wait for the three zeros to come up. You might need to press it twice.
and then we've done our zero and we've closed it off to the outside world. We've reopened the system. And we're ready to go. No, we're zeroing again. I think there was actually a small kink in that when we were filming yeah. it. One, zero, zero, two minus three, starting to get a rudimentary waveform. And, yeah, that's sort of what your arterial line, uh, your arterial waveform will look like, but it's obviously significantly overdamped. So that's zeroing system. This is what the trace is supposed to look like. So once we rectified the problem, got the air bubble out, straightened out the kink, went back, um, we got a nice classical arterial waveform. So we've got the systolic phase of the cardiac cycle. We've got the classic dichrotic notch, which is the closure of the aortic valve. And then we've got the diastolic phase. So obviously the peak systolic pressure is up here and the diastolic pressure is down here. So... That is what your waveform should look like. This is obviously a multi-parameter ECG. We've got the ECG, end title, and art line set up. So caring for your art line. So they do need a little bit of love. Like all good relationships, you get out of it what you put into it or you just marry someone really, really nice and forgiving. So clearly label the catheter, allowing for easy identification. So the biggest thing is we don't want people injecting into these lines. That's an absolute disaster. Um, we want to rewrap the catheter at a minimum once daily, but usually twice. Uh, if the catheter becomes soiled, I think it is important just to either replace the tapes or replace the whole catheter. While you are doing your daily checks, just as we would for an IV line, we need to check for swelling or any pain at the site and document when you check the line, obviously, just like we do for IVs. I think if you're going to keep these in patients after surgery, they definitely need to have an e-collar on them. And if the patient's up and about walking in the cage, it's pretty much impossible in my experience to maintain an art line. Like they're not designed to be used in ambulatory patients. If they do dislodge the catheter, you can end up with, with massive hemorrhage we don't want to place outlines in patients with coagulopathies. And in cats, it's been shown that arterial thrombosis generally develops about after about six to eight hours, so we really don't want to leave them in cats for too long. There was a study in JVEX a couple of years ago looking at complications, and they actually did a really nice job. They looked at 200 catheters. Um, only 12 catheters failed before the end of anesthesia. That's probably because they've got about 25 board-certified anaesthetists at University of Georgia. Some of the sites lost a pulse the next day and no significant complications were really noted at all from the catheters. Funnily enough, I actually listened to a podcast the other day. Cynthia Trim was talking about her paper and she made the comment, Oh, uh, yeah, look, not much really went wrong in those 200 animals, uh, except for um, except for like three cats, their tails fell off and we decided not to include them in the paper. I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, true story. It's on vetgirl.com. Yeah. Um, usually vetgirl is pretty serious, but I thought that one was pretty funny. So this is just to show you what I was talking about before with the three-way tap. It's not the three-way tap at the patient side. It's the three-way tap that's halfway along the semi-rigid tubing. So that's off to the patient, which is how you want it to zero the system. Then you're going to take the little white cap off. So then that'll be continuous to the transducer. You go through the zeroing process. You press the zero IBP. And once you've got your three zeros, you turn it back off to the outside world and put the white cap back on. So this is a little bit about troubleshooting. So... You need to make sure your transducer always stays at the level of the heart. So it's really easy when we're moving in and out of theatre for it to move positions. We need to make sure that the, trans that the pressure transducers we're purchasing have semi-rigid tubing because if you use tubing that's too compliant, you get what's called over-damping of the system where you saw when we first connected up, it was a very flat waveform. 
And that can also happen with air bubbles or pinking or if you get a little clot at the tip of the outline. So over damping is basically when your arterial waveform looks really flat. Under damping is when it's sort of boing, like a really, really spiked, like when you're getting a crazy number um, and they need to be troubleshot individually. Um, air bubbles can cause over or under damping, um, kinks in the semi-rigid tubing and, um, yeah, obviously common sense tells you to check that your outline's not blocked if you're not getting a reading. I just wanted to show you a little video from the human side that just talks a little bit about the mechanics of arterial pressure monitoring and then we'll be pretty close to being done. Transducers in Invasive Pressure Monitoring by Dr. James DiNardo. Hi, my name is Jim DiNardo. I'm a professor of anesthesia at Harvard Medical School and one of the um, cardiac ICU attendings here at Children's Hospital Boston. Today I'm going to be talking about uh, invasive monitoring, specifically arterial pressure monitoring and central venous pressure monitoring. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, transducers and how they work. Transducers. Transducers are a system that converts a mechanical signal which in this case, in the case of pressure monitoring, both for arterial lines and central venous pressure lines, is a pulsatile um, signal. And it's converted through the transducer and then um, through this cable, uh, converted to a digital signal, a pressure waveform, which is what you see on the monitor. And we're not, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about electronically how that works, but... Um, suffice it to say that in order for a transducer to work, it has to be connected by a continuous column of fluid to the um, fluid in the patient's body in the system that you're um, monitoring, ideally with no bubbles in it. Because as we'll talk about, um, the presence of bubbles in the transducer system degrades the um, conversion of the pressure signal uh, to the um, electronic signal that we see on the monitor by damping out the uh, pulses in the system. So um, we have this continuous volume of fluid, and we have um, the transducer generally hooked to a flush system. In this case, uh, this is um, normal saline with a little bit of heparin added running at about three mLs an hour, which is pretty typical. And that may vary um, from institution to institution. And that's just a volume of fluid necessary to um, keep the system uh, free of clot and um, to prevent uh, any thrombus forming on the ends of the catheters, which will also degrade the quality of the system and obviously uh, creates a potential risk to the patient. So if you don't have your syringe driver running in at two or three ml per hour or cc's, uh, you can just hang your pressure bag with a one litre bag of saline and use the little squeezy bulbs on the transducer to flush your system every hour or so. So you can do it manually or you can put it on a syringe driver. Zeroing the transducer. When you zero a transducer, basically what you're doing is telling the transducer system and um, subsequently the monitor um, that the um, pressure being sent to the transducer is basically atmospheric pressure. So the way that's typically done is that we take the transducer and we turn the stopcock off towards the patient so that the only pressure the transducer is seeing now is atmospheric pressure. And that's the circumstance under which we zero a transducer. That tells the transducer to discount any other pressure except the atmospheric pressure in the room. And ideally, the transducer would be here at the level of the patient's heart or near the level of the patient's heart. So once the transducer is zeroed, we now have this continuous column of fluid. Okay, that's enough from Jim. So I just wanted to show you guys a couple of the abnormal signals. So obviously the normal signal on the left there, as we mentioned before, the systolic peak and the diastolic, 
with the diachronic notch uh, representing the closure of the aortic valve. An overdamp signal is, is kind of a flat, stretched out signal. Um, as he mentioned in his video, something like an air bubble can actually reduce the signal. And this is an underdamp signal, which is obviously quite peaked, and that can be troubleshot through the same processes. So in summary, basically gold standard, well worth the effort and well worth the time to practice putting in the outlines. It's a highly accurate way to measure blood pressure and we all know with the tree of life, if we can't maintain cardiac output, we can't deliver oxygen to the tissues and keep these patients alive. You do need to be using it fairly regularly in your practice, I think, to get proficient. Like every time we do a septic abdomen, heme abdomen, craniotomy, like we have a list of standards that really are going to benefit from invasive pressures. The risks are fairly low. And, yeah, it will stay, save lives. So I hope everyone enjoyed the session. We're going to put it up online as a permanent training video. And good luck and call me or email me or track me down. Um, obviously, Tash, Scott, um, Monique, there's heaps of people that have done lots of art lines and lots of our nurses too. Um, we actually had one of our surgery ICU nurses, Laura Cotton, set up an art line in the middle of the night last week, which was just kind of showing how cross-training across the departments can be hugely beneficial as well. So um, look after each other and, yeah, hope you had fun. Bye.